I heard my name. 
All rise. Come to order. 14th Circuit Court, County Muskegon is now in session. The Honorable Matthew R. Casel is presiding. And you may be seated. Before the court is filed 223537FC, it's people of the state of Michigan versus Paul Ferguson. Are you Paul Ferguson, sir? Yes, sir. Answer verbally. Yes, Are sir. You Paul verbally? Yes. All right. Mr. Ferguson appears before the court with his attorney, Mr. Joshua L. Brady. The people are represented by Mr. Matthew Roberts. Same time is scheduled for a sentencing in this case. Have the people had a chance to read the pre sentence report and the attached documents? We have, Your Honor. We have no corrections to that, although I won't. Court is in receipt of a letter this morning, as we all are from um, Paul's older brother. Is there any objection to that? I, I did receive a letter from uh, Nolan Ferguson, who was here to be present for uh, Shonda Bayard's sentencing, and uh, I, I did receive that this morning. I did have a chance to read that uh, before I came on the bench. Do you have a copy as well, Mr. I have a copy, yes, Shonda, and I have no objection to that either. Okay. Uh, also, the court is in receipt of uh, two assessments, psychological assessments. Uh, one is from a Thomas D. Shaver uh, psychiatrist, forensic psychologist uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, it's 25 pages in length. That was submitted by defense counsel uh, at the urging, I will say, of the court uh, asking for that, so I appreciate that, Mr. I also am in receipt of a report from a um, I guess, uh, Samidi Farha, a PhD, licensed psychologist. Uh, this is a seven-page report. It's a psychological assessment as well. It was also provided by defense counsel. The court has reviewed those in anticipation of sentencing. Uh, Mr. Roberts, have you received a copy of those? Yes, I have. And Mr. Alvin Brady, and any objection to the court reviewing those? Considering those as sentencing, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Elvin Brady? No objection, but I would ask those be considered as non-public. Yeah, the court is going to have them scanned into the court file, but they are going to be non-public. They do contain a, a large amount of um, what I would consider very uh, personal medical information that I don't think is appropriate to be in the public domain. The court is going to reference certain conclusory uh, conclusions from these reports, uh, but those do not reveal specific uh, medical information. I think that's appropriate. So the court will, will make these part of the record because it's going to be consider those in sentencing, but again, it's going to be non-public. So, all right. Um, any additions or corrections you have to the pre-sentence report, Mr. Roberts? Uh, beyond that addition, no. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Uh, Elvin Brady, have you had an opportunity to review the pre-sentence report and the attached guidelines? Yes, I have no additions or corrections. I would also note as we're on the topic of letters, I submitted a letter from Stephen and Martha Vander Ark. Those are Mr. Ferguson's, I believe those would be step-grandparents, um, the current placement of his younger half-brother, G. They had intended to be here in support this morning, but were ill this weekend. Okay, yeah, I have also considered that too. Did you receive a copy of that as well, Mr. Roberts? I did. Okay, I've read that too. Uh, I've gotten large number of letters from people that I would say unrelated to this case specifically, um, just you know, individuals who saw it on court TV and, and um, expressing an opinion. I, I am not considering those in sentencing um, because one, they're not directly connected to the case. Uh, I, and I do appreciate the comments from individuals, uh, but I, I think it's important we, we limit the record to the people who actually have something to do with this case or connected with the victim. So unless there's an objection to that. I, I've read them, but I'm not con using it as a consideration. So any objection to that, Mr. Roberts? Okay. Mr. Elvin Brady? I would note, not having seen copies of those, I can't comment on a specific letter, but no issue with that. Yeah, yeah I mean, there, uh, there was, there's just random people who saw it on TV, and I, I just don't think it's appropriate for the court to, to take that into consideration for sentencing purposes. I don't think that's fair to Mr. Ferguson. So, anyway. uh, so no additions or corrections, Mr. 
the no additions or corrections. All right. And uh, Mr. Ferguson, have you received a copy of the, of the pre-sentence report and the attached guidelines? Yes, Your Honor. Any additions or corrections you have? No, Your Honor. And you have, have you had an ample opportunity to discuss the contents of that report with your attorney? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Mr. Roberts, do we have any victim representative who wishes to make a statement today? We do not, Your Honor. Okay. Any comments regarding sentencing? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, as I've said to the court before, uh, this is, as it relates to Paul, this is one of the most difficult cases I think I've ever had to deal with, um, not just from the standpoint of how difficult the subject matter was here, the tragic death of Timothy and the circumstances surrounding it, but just with Paul himself, and, and I'm not saying anything today, but really this, I have told uh, Paul in the multiple meetings that we've had and leading up to the trial and his cooperation here, that, there, that I view him as favorable in that he was willing to help us and to testify against his mother, which I'm sure was very difficult for him to do under the circumstances, uh, but that I was also angry, just frankly angry and, and, and shocked and appalled at, at his treatment of Timothy because he was, for all intents and purposes, the, the enforcer arm of this two person, uh, the, the two people most directly responsible for Timothy's death, that he was the one that would be allowed most of the punishments that were directed by Ms. Van der Ark and certainly um, she's received the appropriate sentence for her role in this as well. So I, I had mixed emotions about Paul, um, even up to and including the time that he testified in this trial, and those frankly continue. Um, one of the things that, that we discussed at the time of the plea was giving Mr. Elvin Brady an opportunity to get the evaluations that we now have in an effort to hopefully demonstrate in some regard why Paul did these things. Uh, was it was it a psychological condition? Was there some manipulation taking place? Um, and quite frankly, I think just as my feeling is, is there's good and bad with Paul, I think both of these assessments reflect the same thing. Um, what is absolutely clear from both of these assessments is that whatever upbringing Paul had um, from, his, from his mother and frankly from his father as well, led to him being how he is today. And that, that was a childhood that I think both reports indicate was marked with abuse and neglect. Uh, very traumatic upbringing, uh, moved around a lot, and, and what also rings through in this, these assessments is that nobody did anything to get Paul any help uh, when, when it could have made a difference. Um, so so that, is, that is, in some respects, that's the good part of this because it does seek to at least explain in some regard why Paul behaved the way that he did. Uh, but there's bad in here as well, uh, and I'm sure the court will note this, but the, the, the one sentence that struck me in Dr. Shazer's report uh, is that it says, in my opinion, Paul Fer Ferguson was predisposed to abuse his brother independent of his mother's presence and active influence in his life. Um, that's frankly scary. Uh, and there's other scary parts of this as well that, that indicate that Paul was at least in some respect predisposed to being essentially a bully. Um, and, and that's that, that's how you could view his behavior, is that, that he was a bully. Now, nobody, I think, would expect any bully to take it to the extreme of actually killing a person, uh, although certainly it does happen, but, but nobody would expect that that was an intentional outcome that Paul sought here. Um, and we can't lose sight of the fact that Paul didn't become this way in a vacuum, that, that his upbringing, in some respects, led to him being predisposed, as this report indicates, and I think the other report references it as well, that he was predisposed to already doing some of these things. Um, frankly, I think that Ms. Van der Ark took advantage of that and used Paul because she saw an opportunity to have Paul to do the, the horrible things that she couldn't do herself or wouldn't do herself, but be done at her direction. Uh, and Paul was unfortunately willing to go along with those things because of, again, because of everything that had happened to him, because of his traumatic upbringing and because of the conditions that he did have uh, that, that led to that. So. The, it's hard to balance these things out. Um, certainly, we did not have this report at the time that Paul pled, um, and I, I don't know that in looking at this report that the decision that was made in this case would be any different, um, but certainly there are things here that would have been nice to have been able to consider, but we didn't have the benefit of that. And as, as I told the court, I think I've told the court on several occasions in speaking to the jury, they were, uh, in, in Ms. Van der Ark's case, very much Pressed by might not be the right word, but but certainly factored in Paul's testimony a great deal. 
uh, believed that he was telling the truth, believed that he was honest about what his role in this and, and Ms. Vander Ark's role in this. So I think his testimony was instrumental in, in achieving the conviction that was that was uh, achieved here against Ms. Vander Ark. So I certainly owe Paul that consideration. And But beyond that, I, I, I certainly don't envy the position the court is in today. Um, in balancing everything that has taken place here, the, the good and the bad, uh, even in this report, and the good and the bad with Paul, I, I will stick to the agreement that we have made here. I will ask the court to sentence within the sentencing guidelines in this case. Certainly the court has, look, the court is, is obviously free to exceed the guidelines if it feels there's a basis to do so, and quite frankly, there are reasons to exceed the guidelines. In some respects, there's reasons to go below the guidelines as well. So literally, I think any number that the court chooses to pick here, I think could, would be the appropriate sentence because I think it's it's a difficult balancing act that the court has to do here. Um, but my commitment was and continues to be that we would ask the court to sentence within the sentencing guidelines. I would ask the court, however, to impose a, a maximum number here that is essentially equivalent to what Paul's life expectancy would be. And the reason for that is that if some of the bad that's indicated in these reports is actually present and, and Paul does not receive treatment for that and, and those conditions that, that are noted here, most notably the potential antisocial disorder, the, the essentially a sociopath, if those things are borne out in, in the prison system, that the prison system then has the opportunity to keep Paul locked up as, as long as possible. Uh, I, I hope that he can get some treatment inside there. But the bad in here has got to be addressed, and if it's not, then certainly Paul does represent a threat to the public moving forward because of his disassociation, essentially, from feeling empathy or feeling bad about the things that he had done. In the moment, it did not appear that Paul felt bad about those things. There certainly was a moment where he, he thought he needed to let his mother know that Timothy was very thin and that they should start feeding him. But overall, what comes through in this, these reports is that, for the most part, those were absent, and the text messages, I think, even bear that out as well. But even after that noting of, of the fact that Timothy was very thin and that they needed to start feeding him, Paul was still a willing participant in the, in the truly tragic and horrible things that happened in the last days of Timothy's life, including the prolonged ice bath that Paul watched over. Um, so, so certainly that, that bad needs to be addressed as well. Um, so again, I, I, I don't envy the position the court is in today. I will stick with my commitment here and ask the court to sentence within the sentencing guidelines. But quite frankly, any number that the court picks here, I think would be an appropriate sentence uh, for Mr. Ferguson. Um, I'm pleased that we've been able to achieve, to achieve whatever justice we could for Timothy here in both of these convictions. And, and certainly the two people most directly responsible for what happened to Timothy are, are going to, in all likelihood, be incarcerated for an extended period of time, certainly in Ms. Van der Ark's case for the rest of her life, which is completely justified under these circumstances. So I would ask the court to, as it, as it will have to do, to weigh the good and the bad here in these reports. Uh, and, and I trust the court's, uh, I trust whatever decision the court makes here. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Elden Brayton, you have your shift. Your Honor, I'd like to start by responding to a point that Mr. Robert made before I go into um, the multiple points I plan to address. I, I understand the prosecutor's characterization of Paul as being the enforcer, as being the primary one. But I believe part of that is based simply on the evidence that we have. This court's heard the text messages, extensive text messages of Ms. Van Der Ark instructing Paul on what he was to do to Timothy. They've heard Paul's, you've heard Paul's testimony about what he was instructed to do and what he did. The rest of the time, when she was there doing whatever she did, Paul was at work. She didn't have to send text messages to herself. Timothy's not here to talk about what happened when it was just him and his mother. So I, I disagree with that characterization. I, I believe, based on what we do know of Ms. Van der Ark, that there was far, far more that went on. There was far, far more that she did that there simply is no evidence of, no one to speak of, because the only person alive who knows what she did is her. Beyond that, Reading the pre-sentence report in this case, I can't 
argue with the reasonableness of the recommendations in the pre-sentence report. I also really can't add anything about the offense, about the details of what happened to Timothy. You presided over the same trial that I watched. I know in motions, other paperwork submitted to the court, you're aware of far, far more than what came out publicly, what was submitted to the jury. What I'd ask the court to consider, I, I think there's five fronts on which Paul should be evaluated very differently than where his mother is. And the first is just capacity to understand. We heard Ms. Vander Ark's attorney argue they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't realize that it could kill him or cause that level of injury. And I don't have to come to a conclusion. I don't have to say I think that's right or that's wrong to understand that a 41-year-old law school graduate who was, by her own boasting, at the top of her class, who passed the bar with flying colors, who would have been an attorney, well, academically was qualified to be an attorney. We never got an answer of why she wasn't. And who worked for the court both from a legal front, from a moral front, from an intellectual front, had far, far more capacity to understand what she was doing and the potential consequences of what she was doing than her son, who was a 20-year-old high school graduate who worked as a dishwasher. There's simply no comparison in capacity, in life experience, in an ability to understand and recognize what was happening. Second, well, we recognize for purposes of the child abuse statute, for purposes of Paul's plea, the law may not distinguish between a parent and another person over the age of 18 who's placed in charge of a child. We all know a mother has a very different role than a sibling. We all know that there's a certain level of rivalry, a certain level of competition that we expect between siblings, which is very different than the care that we expect from parents. Third, and I'll come back to the text messages, it was very clear Paul was the follower and his mother was the leader in this case listening to over an hour of text messages read during her trial, there's pieces missing. We don't get the whole story because she talked to him over the camera, or she talked to him on the phone, or she talked to him in person. But what is very clear from those text messages is there is not a single time that Paul gives an instruction. Every single time an instruction is given, you need to do this. It is given by her. Fourth, and Mr. Roberts has addressed this regarding Paul's cooperation. Once the gravity of what happened sank in, I believe from the reports that was a day or so after, Paul has shown remorse. He's shown confusion over how he could have done this and recognition that it was wrong. He's testified honestly. He's fully cooperated. In many areas, in ways that were not of clear benefit to him. His mother did none of these things. She took the stand and lied, redirected. It's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. And fifth, and I think very important in looking at the evaluation of Mr. Ferguson, it's very clear that he and his other siblings were also victims of their mother. CPS involvement, going back to when they were in elementary school, back when Timothy was 18 months old, a third grade teacher who said Paul and Nolan are secretive about what happens at home. They're not supposed to talk 
So when Mr. Johnson argued in cross-examination to Paul, why didn't you report it to somebody? A lifetime of being told you're not supposed to talk about what goes on at home. A lifetime of being isolated, separated from peers, having no meaningful social contacts outside his household. That all started with her. A record that when Timothy was 18 months old, when Paul was seven, that Timothy was underfed, failure to thrive. Paul didn't have anything to do with that. He was seven. But that was the pattern. That was his entire life. That was his entire framework. That was what she taught him from the beginning or at times failed to teach him through neglect. Mr. Roberts referenced, and I don't remember if it was in sentencing or in his closing argument, that the difference between Timothy and Paul was that Paul was useful. Timothy wasn't. At least not to their mother. And I wouldn't disagree with that characterization. But I think that's important for the court to consider. Timothy was treated the way he was because he wasn't useful. That's how children in their mother's household were treated if they weren't useful. And I believe at some level, some part of Paul understood that. He understood that we do these things to Timothy because he misbehaves, because he doesn't follow instruction and because he's not useful. And part of understanding that is also understanding that if he didn't follow instruction, if he misbehaved, if he got on her bad side, that he could once again be subject to some of the same mistreatment. On the neglect front, I don't think any of them ever ceased to be subject to that mistreatment. And I'll end with his mother's own words from the text messages read in court. To Paul, quote, if he falls asleep for you, from you, not watching, that is not going to end well for either of you. Thank you. Right. If I can just make one more brief point, and not in response to anything Mr. Elvenberg has said, but the court referenced that it, it's had a lot of outside people contacting the court. I certainly have had that as well. Um, it, and one of the, one of the consistent themes there is people believing that Paul suffers or not suffers. I shouldn't. It's it's not a suffering. That Paul is on the autism spectrum. Um, I think it's important to note that in both of these evaluations, that's not borne out. Um, certainly, people may have that have that belief and. and think that that should be a factor here, but there's nothing in either one of these reports that supports that conclusion. So I, I just want to note that. Um, that is certainly something that I think the court could have considered, uh, but there's nothing in the report that would support that, and I don't think Mr. Eldon Brady would disagree with that point. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to reference that in my comments as well. So, Your Honor, I, I think the reports do bear out that some of the characteristics that those individuals are observing in coming to that conclusion are connected to that neglect and abuse and um, I believe it was Dr. Farrakh characterized as uh, normalization of abnormal behavior. Um, so while I agree that, that both analysis seem to have come to the conclusion that that diagnosis is inappropriate, um, I don't believe that those observations by the individuals mentioning that are ungrounded. It's simply that, that those uh, behavioral characteristics come from a different source and therefore do not lead to the ability to officially diagnose with that condition. That does not change the fact that those characteristics are there, that those characteristics are relevant to Paul's interactions with his mother, or that those characteristics are relevant to um, ongoing treatment services that Paul will need moving.
Mr. Ferguson, anything you wish to say prior to sentencing? Um, yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> what reasons could justify my actions? I could make up a thousand and never believe one. What words could voice my regrets? I can think of millions, yet never was enough. If I could do it all again and do it right, I would. I feel I will pay for my choices and yet never feel better because he's still gone. I have had time to think during my time in Muskegon County Jail and I've realized many things about myself that I might never have, other, have considered otherwise. My problems and flaws, to put it simply, are the place to begin correction of self. I ask the judge for nothing more than mercy and fairness, to offer me compassion so I might learn from him. I only hope to better myself in the coming days and serve my time with what little honor I have left and to make right my faults in search of a better tomorrow. First and uh, foremost, uh, as Mr. Roberts referenced, uh, the court is in a, in a pretty, was in a difficult position. Uh, this particular case, I think a lot of individuals saw Mr. Ferguson testify, and I think there were concerns about intellectual uh, and potential disabilities, and the court was concerned with that as well. Uh, there was also a concern uh, whether Mr. Ferguson was the was the target of manipulation on the heart, on behalf of his mother. Uh, and the reports that were submitted to the court really did help me a lot um, in trying to parse those issues out. Uh, the report specifically by Dr. Shazer is very in-depth um, and very well done. And I, and I thank him for, for doing such a detailed analysis So the, the first concern of the court was whether or not Mr. Ferguson was suffering from some sort of intellectual disability, whether it be autism or something else. And uh, there's a couple references to that throughout his uh, Mr. Sh excuse me, Dr. Shazer's report. And um, specifically, the first reference that the court had highlighted was on uh, page uh, two of the report, uh, first full paragraph, and it says, uh, in my opinion, he, referring to Mr. Ferguson, was clearly either psychotic or suffering from symptoms of a mood disorder at the time of the current interview. And he was apparently functioning within at least the normal range of intellectual ability at this time. Thus, in my opinion, he does not suffer from a chronic psychotic disorder, a chronic mood disorder, or an intellectual disability. There is another reference more to the end of the report uh, where he indicates uh, thus his, his referring to Mr. Ferguson, his educational history is inconsistent with him suffering from intellectual deficits and as noted above, he was apparently functioning within at least the normal range of intellectual ability at the time of the career interview. In my opinion, the defendant clearly does not suffer from an intellectual disability. So the court, uh, that was helpful in the court because as, as in, in some of the letters that I received as well, Mr. Roberts indicated that there was concern that Mr. Ferguson was autistic. Uh, and I think probably more toward that was easier to maybe manipulate him and that kind of thing. And certainly the court does take someone's intellectual capacity into consideration. I think it's important to understand the full situation. So the court, uh, and that, and, and although those are two small portions of the opinion that the court referenced, uh, they're borne out by much more in-detail history uh, in Dr. Shazer's report. Uh, specifically, Dr. Shazer uh, analyzed every statement that the defendant gave the police. He also watched the testimony of Mr. Ferguson, uh, interviewed him himself. He also looked through uh, his history. From the Oklahoma Department of Health and Human Services, looked through his history 
uh, from school records, from various psychological assessments that were conducted throughout his life uh, based on the report. So I think that opinion is well grounded uh, in not only his interview, his review of educational records, his review of mental health records, and, um, and everything else, Health West records currently from when he was uh, assessed when he became in the Muskegon County Jail. So the court uh, finds that to be quite persuasive in terms of whether or not Mr. Ferguson is suffering from any intellectual disability. And the court can, concludes based on, on this report, uh, well-written report, well-grounded in, in uh, fact and history of the defendant that he was not suffering from an intellectual disability currently or at the time of this offense. Uh, the second thing is whether or not Mr. Ferguson was somehow manipulated or coerced by his mother. Uh, I think all of us would like to believe that this is a product of manipulation, that this is simply somebody doing something that they were told to do, that they were afraid uh, Mr. Alvin Brady mentioned it in his allocution regarding the specific text messages. Well, those specific text messages I heard as well at the trial. Uh, shortly after the trial concluded, I asked the prosecutor's office for a complete copy of every single text message that would occur between Ms. Vanderart and Mr. Ferguson because I didn't want just the snippets, the kind of highlights or the you know the, the real you know juicy stuff, for lack of a better term. I wanted to understand completely what the conversation was between these individuals. I read every single text message, every one of them. I, I think there's thousands in there, and I read it three times now, three times in total. I read it you know, two months ago, I read it a month ago, and I read it last week Friday. The entire afternoon was spent reading through these things, and I think it's clear to me that Mr. Ferguson, although he says that he was scared of his mother or there's an allegation at that standpoint, I find that just the opposite to be true based on those text messages. Uh, there is some mention about punishment, but I think Mr. Ferguson, um, in my opinion, t uh, being submissive, for lack of a better term, to his mother was a result that he really had nowhere else to go. Uh, he had been kicked out from his father's house. For, for failing to obey his father's rules and for other things. And he went to his mother's house, and I don't think Mr. Ferguson really had anywhere else to go. I think he was sort of uh, beholden to his mother uh, in terms of, well, there's gonna be consequences. Although there are some text messages, one or two of those that bear that out, uh, this strikes me in the text messages as more of a collaborative effort. In fact, there's some text messages where Ms. Van der Ark actually tells Mr. Ferguson uh, that if Ms. Timothy does not behave, essentially, I'm going to leave him to you, as in that he's going to let the dog out and just bob off the chain. And uh, Mr. Ferguson also several times um, essentially tells his mother things that are going on that are bad. Uh, and I think it's because he wants his mother to give him the permission to go ahead and engage in punishment. So in terms of, of whether or not his mother, he was somehow afraid of his mother, uh, I don't think that'd be the case. Now, that was my initial feeling about it, my, and what, I, what I took it as, and that's why I wanted the uh, assessment regarding whether or not he was being manipulated. And luckily, we, uh, we did get one from uh, the second one I referenced was from Dr. Farhat, which is uh, specifically, I think he was, he was asked to uh, assess this particular uh, question. And in the beginning of his assessment, is, he says that specifically, I was asked to assess whether Mr. Ferguson possessed a psycholo psychological disorder of traits that would render him significantly susceptible to manipulation, coercion, or suggestibility after conducting the evaluation, I could not substantiate these traits as they pertain to the commission of the offense. As such, this report will instead explain the nature of the evaluation and my overall opinions regarding Mr. Ferguson's psychological functioning. 
Uh, he also opined uh, regarding his uh, intellectual uh, abilities. He says, from a diagnostic standpoint, I did not find sufficient evidence to support Mr. Ferguson meeting criteria for any specific mental disorder. While one may consider whether his presentation suggested a neurodevelopmental condition, for example, e.g. autism spectrum disorder, I did not find this to be an appropriate label. Instead, I attributed his overall demeanor and presentation to factors such as a lack of socialization, normalization of abnormal dynamics and experiences, poor interpersonal skills, and emotional dysregulation. He also indicated later on on that page that I was initially asked to evaluate whether Mr. Ferguson had a mental condition or traits that would have rendered him susceptible to coercion, manipulation, or suggestibility at the time of the offense. Ultimately, I could not arrive at this conclusion based on the totality of the available information. Available evidence noted, noted that he was capable of appreciating the abuse towards his brother, that he was capable of recognizing the detrimental impact it had, and that he at times disobeyed Ms. Van der Ark and tried to provide his brother with aid and support. Furthermore, despite reporting that he was under Ms. Van der Ark's, quote, psychological hold, he adamantly denied that he was coerced or manipulated into enforcing the abuse. Additionally, he recognized to some degree pleasure in having power and control over his younger brother. In this sense, while I acknowledge that he reported experiencing fear and concerns of disobeying Ms. Van der Ark, I could not reliably substantiate his involvement as being a byproduct of suggestibility, uh, suggestibility or co co coercion. So what this court is left to conclude is that Mr. Ferguson, the way I look at this is that Mr. Ferguson and these reports, and a lot of these, there's, throughout the report, there's, there's talk about how Mr. Ferguson bullied his brother uh, when he was younger. Uh, that uh, there's a mention, his, his stepsister, who I think was uh, allocated on behalf of his mother, uh, or, or, or on behalf of Paul, uh, excuse me, Timothy, at his, uh, at Miss Vanderark's sentencing. This is, this is the stepsister, and this is before the police even really gave, told her about exactly what had happened in here. It says the stepsister reportedly told the police that, quote, she doesn't know how involved Paul was in this situation, but he is the biggest bully she has ever met in her life, and he found genuine joy in tormenting Timothy whenever possible. Judge, for clarification, I don't think that was Millie that the okay, stepsister so maybe I'm wrong. Millie. Okay, so perhaps I'm wrong about that. But this was someone who, without even knowing the full details, uh, reported that. Uh, in one of the interviews, uh, Mr. Ferguson indicated that he liked getting praised by Shonda and admitted he liked having control over Timothy. He reportedly admitted having power over somebody feels good. Later in the, in the interview, I asked him whether he had felt ashamed at the time when he was abusing his brother, and he said, quote, no, he had not. I asked whether he had recognized his actions as morally wrong at the time, and he again said, quote, no, he had not. He then volunteered that on one occasion, quote, I sent her a photo of how thin he was, and, and, why, and when I asked why he did this, he explained that I was worried. When asked when he was worried about Mr. Ferguson, uh, Ferguson replied that he had been concerned for his house and there that he was nothing but bones. I asked him whether he had, at the moment, thought that this abusive behavior was wrong, and he replied that, quote, that thought never even crossed my mind. treatment plan back from July 22nd of 2012 indicates that, quote, client, meaning Mr. Ferguson, sometimes bullies his younger brother, the decedent, Timothy. The report also uh, mentions cruelty to animals, stealing, abuse. His mother at the time, back in 2018, told staff at the clinic he's become bossy, telling his siblings what to do, 
For Lisa Ferguson's part, reportedly when commenting about his being irritable, he admits that this is due to his younger siblings not listening. He gets physically aggressive towards his younger siblings. Uh, also, he also tried to lock his younger brother, i.e. apparently a reference to the decedent in the closet because his brother wouldn't listen to him. So the, the court read this and certainly looks at this as someone who is predisposed, I think was the ultimate conclusion, predisposed to abuse his brother, specifically the victim in this case, in a history of doing that. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Mr. Ferguson is a result of years and years and years of physical neglect and abuse on behalf of his mother. No doubt in my mind that's borne out in this report. But the court is asked to essentially ignore the, the decisions or his behavior because of that and to somehow say that we're going to minimize the damage and what he did in this case because of that. If the court started imposing that standard, I think we would be in, in, in real trouble because every defendant that comes before this court has a horrible history, I would say. That's the reason they're here people that have supportive parents and, and things go good for them typically don't come here. Now that's not always the case, believe me, there's a lot of interventions, but everybody has a history. And what I was looking at is whether or not this is a product of his mother or his situation, and what I can conclude is that this is not. Mr. Ferguson is trying to shift blame from his mother, from him to his mother to say that somehow, well, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have done this, or she's the one that did this. At the trial, well, at her, at her order, at her order, at her order, he kept saying it over and over and over again, and just keep underscoring the point. And if that had been an isolated incident, if that had been one or two of these things, if that had been a punishment that he administered, maybe the court could accept that. But we have an individual who is in a household for six months, intentionally himself engaging in torture of another person. And he doesn't, he said, well, I'm worried about what my mom's going to say. Clearly, that doesn't, it's not borne out in his reports. He had the ability to disobey his mom. In fact, he was on the stand and almost boasted that well, I gave him extra food. Weren't you worried about how your mom was going to be upset? I still gave him extra food. So what that tells me is that this has been a careful, manipulated, manipulated story by Mr. Ferguson from the very beginning of this thing that he's going to put the blame on his mom. I'm going to be manipulated. I have Asperger's syndrome. I have autism. I have Stockholm syndrome. He's mentioned him saying, well, maybe I have Stockholm syndrome. This is an individual. But the truth of this is, the truth of this is, is that we have two individuals, two individuals that lack empathy, who lack emotion, and both of them, the triggering factor in this report, the triggering factor that caused this abuse was the removal of the husband, of the stepdad. Once he was gone, these two individuals were free to torture somebody, and they did it. That's what they did. And I think Ms. Vanderark did use Mr. Ferguson. I think that she knew from his history that he was predisposed to torment Timothy. I think that she knew that he would have no problem doing that. And Mr. Ferguson walked through that door and was happy to be being forced. He was happy to do it and continue to torture his brother over and over shell of a person until he was dead, died from starvation, died from hypothermia, he had no, no fat on him, barely any muscle on him, and the whole time just letting it happen, letting it happen.
report says, it appears that the stepfather's presence in the home had prevented Paul and his mother from abusing the victim. Again, it wasn't anything to do. They were just holding him back, essentially. The overall opinion, which I think is important, is, in my opinion, although the defendant's participation in the abuse was a pin was in a part a function of his social milieu and living situation. These contextual factors were not a necessary condition for his participation. As previously noted, mental health records contain information to the effect that while they were still living with their father and stepmother, and reportedly had no contact with their mother, Mr. Ferguson's stepmother told the psychiatrist that he had become bossy, telling his siblings what to do, and the defendant himself that he would become irritable due to his younger siblings not listening. He gets physically aggressive, he's told his younger also reports that he's gotten irritated with his siblings and has pushed them in retaliation. He's also tried to lock his younger brother, get him seated in the closet because his brothers wouldn't listen to him. Consistent with this, Norton Shores Police Department documents indicate that Mr. Ferguson's stepsister told police, quote, he is the biggest bully she's ever in this in her life, and he found genuine joy in tormenting two things that were possible when they were living in the biological father's home. Notably, the defendant allegedly engaged in this abusive behavior despite there being any safety rules in place, and despite his father and stepmother disapproving of this behavior to such an extent that they removed him from their home once he turned 18 because of it. In my opinion, Paul Ferguson was predisposed to abuse his brother independent of his mother's present and active influence in his life. Nonetheless, in my opinion, Mr. Ferguson's involvement in repeated acts of abuse that amounted to physical and psychological torture over a period of months reflects a general lack of empathy for his brother and a lack of remorse for his actions. Concludes that, in my opinion, there is no reason to believe that Mr. Ferguson's conduct disorder has remitted or that his participation in the abuse of his brother was not an expression of a persistent court is concerned uh, that Mr. Ferguson will not get the help he needs in prison. Uh, I think he's one step away from becoming a psychopath like his mother. And uh, the court is concerned that he represents a danger to the public. Uh, that if released, he, he would represent a significant danger to the public. The, chi the, the charge here is child abuse. And um, I don't think this charge or the sentencing guidelines take into adequate consideration of the long sustained torture in this case. As I indicated in Ms. Vander Ark's testimony, there was a long, long period of months uh, of, of various punishments, including uh, bread with hot sauce. There's hot sauce that apparently contains two of the hottest peppers that we have in, in the world. Uh, wall sits for an individual who practically had no muscle left. Running up and down stairs, cleaning out a garage with no pants on, sleep deprivation in itself. Uh, putting alarms on him so he couldn't move or sleep. Uh, making him puke up food. There's bathroom timers. Sleeping in the closet with a tarp down, uh, which quite frankly might be considered animal, you know, animal abuse. But we have a human being here making his hands over his head. And then at the end of his life, an eight hour practically ice bath that killed him. So no, I don't think any of those things are, are, taking, are, are adequately taken into consideration by the guidelines. And I don't think the guidelines, quite frankly, can even, these guidelines don't justify Mr. Ferguson's actions. Mr. Ferguson, I, I think you are a product of your environment, but I don't believe you that you're sorry. I don't. I don't think you have empathy. I don't think you have any emotion whatsoever. And that's what scares the court. It really scares me. Uh, I think you're sorry that you're here. I think you're sorry you got caught. I don't think you wanted Tim to die either like your mother because you would get caught and you wouldn't torture him anymore. And um, believe me, I, I've tried to sit here and try to think, well, maybe Mr. Ferguson's not as bad as mom. 
I think you're just as bad, if not worse. If not worse. Because you, you had a job. You, you could have, Mr. Johnson actually asked you, couldn't you have brought home a, 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 a thing of food for him? You could have gone to a neighbor and said, hey, my mom's abusing him. You could have, you could have grabbed him and got him out of there. You could have done any number of things to stop this. And you chose not to. Your own brother. And uh, this is where we're at. So, based on all that, it's a sentence of the court. You served 30 years to 100 years, Michigan Department of Corrections. Credit for 592 days you've already served. Court's going to assess the $68 state cost, $130 crime rate, rate assessment, no additional crime rate costs. Mr. Ferguson, you have a right to file an appeal in this case. If you find that it's retained, an attorney will be appointed to a public expense. Plus, the assistance of the lawyer must be made in 42 days from today's date. Clerk is handing you a form that you must complete. Return to the court in that 42 days if you wish to request the appointment of an attorney on appeal or adjourn. Jail judge. What's that? Clancy?